Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another Sunday talk within the Nine Sided Circle. I am your host, Noor Kyle. And I am her faithful sidekick, Mushtaq Ali. Yeah, my faithful sidekick, always by my side. Always kicking. Always kicking. <laughs> yep, in your Chuck Norris kicking jeans. No one's shins are safe. <laughs> All right, so thank you for joining us, whether you're here live on Zoom or watching on the YouTube replay. So good to have you here. Lovely to spend this quality time with you. Uh, Got to do our YouTube spiel in which we mentioned to you that we would love it if you would uh, subscribe to our channel, perhaps, and put a like on this video if you enjoy it. Share it with your friends. Perhaps they'll learn something useful. And leave a comment if you have a question or you want to join the conversation. Perhaps you have some relevant thoughts to share that I'm sure all of us would benefit from. And uh, you can also join our mailing list or email list, which will give you the option of joining our special mailing list to come on here live on Zoom and join the party. We know you're jealous. But we'd love to have you included so you don't have to be jealous anymore. And that's how you do that. And donations, Mushtaq. I'm going to let you speak to that today. So we have started our fun drive where we ask all of you, each and every one of you who can, to give us a little donation so we can help pay our bills for this year. Our bills have doubled since last year, and we need to raise about $5,000 to pay for everything. Um, and it would be wonderful if y'all would uh, drop a few coins in the begging bowl, as it were. Yep. And this is something that we can work on together. Don't have to have everybody work so hard to do it all on their own shoulders. Thank you so much for helping us yeah. out. And we want only what you can afford. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This is donations from disposable income. If that makes sense to you. Don't take something that you need for something important for yourself and send it to us. You know, give up a cup of coffee or something. That's okay. But a valiant sacrifice. That's a valiant sacrifice. <laughs> Yep. And you can also buy t-shirts as well. Yeah. Yep. So those links for all of that stuff are in the description. Everything I've mentioned. Huh. And later on, pay attention to this station and you will discover that there is going to be an amusing prize. <laughs> Somebody who donates is going to get something wonderful. And we aren't even going to tell you what it is yet. <laughs> Yep. But, you know, we'll talk more about that and see what we need to do to put in place and who knows what it might be. Mm. Thank you, James, for your suggestion. We'll see what we can do in that regard. All right. Any other things we need to mention, Mushtaq, before we move on? No, I don't think so. So no. what are we doing tonight, Noor? Let's get straight to the party. We're talking about, you know, with all this blathering, it's kind of ironic, but I promise you it will make sense as we go. Cultivating the silence. We're going to be talking about how to cultivate the silence for ourselves, within ourselves, given how valuable a commodity silence within can be these days. I'm sure we all know that from personal experience, don't we? One hopes. Hmm. So where should we begin, Mushtaq? Well, you should begin with a story. When I was in the fifth grade, I invented meditation. This is not to say that other people haven't invented it before me, but I knew nothing about that. And this came about in this way. 
I had a fifth grade teacher. His name was Mr. Freer. And I hated this man's guts. He was a bully. He was abusive to his students. He was generally a bad teacher. And I had uh, two joys in my life. One was beating him at chess. And the other was proving him wrong about anything. And one day he made the statement in class that it was impossible to stop thinking. And I remember sitting in class going, why is it impossible to stop thinking? So I began to practice not thinking. I had no idea that like Zen people did this or anything, had never heard of meditation, had never heard of any of this stuff. I just worked on making my thoughts stop. And I found a couple of techniques that worked for me. It took some weeks of practice before I could get anywhere. And for at least a month, I could only stop thinking for moments at a time. But with practice, I discovered that I could hold a state of not thinking uh, for longer and longer periods. And my main method was to listen to my thoughts as the internal monologue went chattering along and find a space between two words. And I would focus on that space. So I would watch my thoughts. And when there was a pause in the thoughts, I would focus on that pause and see how long I could hold the pause. And I discovered, first of all, that he was wrong, which I knew, because he was always wrong about anything. If he said the sky was blue, I would look outside just to check. But uh, I discovered that I liked this. That it was fun to not think. And that was his description of not thinking was to, to still the internal dialogue. And so fast forward about uh, six years, and here I am reading the Yoga Sutras, which I checked out from the uh, bookmobile where I lived, had a, a uh, copy there. And it talked about yoga being the stilling of the twistings of the mind. By twistings, we understood it to mean the uh, the chatter. And I had no words of Sanskrit at the time. Later on, I learned that uh, what it said in Sanskrit was chitta vritti. Chitta is cognitive mind, and vritti is rolling, twisting, turning, churning. And I realized that I had just out of sheer spite created a meditative practice. So it can be done and there is value to it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And we've talked about a bunch of them, but without the ability to create that moment of, of conscious silence. Uh, your practices don't really go anywhere. So does this make sense to everybody, this idea of stilling the mind? Cessation of thought? Any questions so far? All right. I think everyone's just on board and coming along. Good. So how do you cultivate silence? One of the 
traditional way is, is go into a monastery, go into a room, sit and be quiet. These days, that is usually not as easy as it was at one point, for at least some people. You can try and replace the, the noise in your head with something um, that you choose to be there. But I find that that isn't really science or silence. You know, you can sit there and say over to over and over to yourself, oh, money, pod me, hum, oh, money, pod me, hum. And it, that's just a particular kind of noise. And it's trance inducing. And here's the thing. Real silence wakes you from the trance. Think about that. Real silence wakes you from the trance. So let's all try an experiment. Sit up comfortably. Straighten your spine as much as you can. Get the kinks out of your neck. And begin to observe your thoughts, specifically the, the verbal thoughts. I mean, if there's pictures, you can observe those too. And at the same time, observe your body, specifically your breathing. And when you find a space between the words that you talk to yourself in your head, grab hold of that space and stretch it out. Focus your attention on the space between the noises in your head. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that you'll be present when you do this. You'll be in the room, wherever you are, inside or outside. You have an environment and you will be aware of it. And you'll notice that you can stop the chatter in your mind. And instead of chattering in your mind, take that space and use it to be aware of your breath. And then notice if you're awake or not. It's going to be easy to fall asleep doing this because that's our usual avoidance mechanism for being awake is to just fall asleep. Don't do that. Stay awake. Now, holding that as much as possible, how is that for you? When everybody talk at once. Can you do it? First of all, James. It seems to come and go in pulses. Um, now, I don't know if that's a trancey aspect. That's just the way it works. Okay. Most of us have that dialogue running most of the time and it kind of runs unconsciously and so you have a groove worn in your mind that is very easy to fall back into mm. well, i've been practicing this for you know over a year now in various ways and forms and uh, i can get Silent moments, relatively easy, especially if I'm already calm. <clears throat> but then, then, then the noise—I, I go out and grab hold of the noise again, and and it all goes away. But yeah, yeah. And that's what I feel like I'm doing. Like when the noise is distracting me, it's because I'm engaging with it. So. It feels very much like that. Now, it doesn't just 
happen to distract me off when it happens, I feel like I feel part of me is going, grabbing and paying attention to it, and getting involved. Osama. Yeah, that was um, when you were telling the story of your uh, favorite teacher, um, and when you when you said the the silence between the words, like the second you said that, it had an effect on me. And suddenly the silence between your words became like there was space in that. So that was, that was interesting to, to experience. Um, Tricky these dervishes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, that was actually awesome. Um, and, and then doing it and hearing your voice, it, it became like your voice, the silence between the words in your voice, that was, that became the, um, that became high end. And also for me in music, that's, that's another tool um, that I, I, I notice in music as well, that the silent, when there's silence, conscious, like there's like, they actually put, uh, I mean, silence is there all the time in music. Um, but when when they create that silence, it just it wakes you up, and then you back to that music, and it's like, whoa, what just happened? Um, so it was similar. It was a similar experience like that. Yeah, yeah. Without those silences between the notes, you don't really have music. You just have one long slur. One of the things that some of you have experienced is, so we were in India. We started out in Delhi. Delhi is cacophonous. It is chaotic. It is uh, a place of insanity and madness. And we went from there through various adventures up into the Himalayas, where it was silent. Except for chirping birds. Okay. And... Yeah, when a bird chirped, you noticed because mm -hmm. there was nothing else. Yep. You know, there was breezes in the trees. There was birds chirping. That were There was occasional people pounding on pots and pans to scare off le leopards. But it was quiet in comparison thunderstorms you could actually hear coming yeah. from afar and that is one of the traditional ways to find silence is to go up into some place like the the himalayas and hang out there where you get that profound silence and your brain can attune to it yeah you tend to find Holy guys in mountains, deserts, places where uh, places where you can find that silence. They're relatively out of the way places. Yeah. Just as an outward way of helping you develop it. So, is finding silence useful for you? Can you see it as a possibility for yourself that can have some value?
And if so, how? This is not going to be one of these super energetic talks where we spend a lot of time entertaining you. Uh, you stuck. Yes. On a, on a physical level, the silence helps me uh, stop my brain diarrhea. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, it really helps me to release pain I was collecting in my body throughout the day. So I personally think it's really useful. And, and, and I live in Delhi, so you can understand. Yes. And you did something very interesting with your home, which is you created... Uh, uh, an oasis of silence in your home. Thank you. The way that you you rebuilt your house and built the garden and everything, you created some external silence, which I believe lends itself very, very nicely to the uh, internal silence. I'm working on the internal silence. Yeah, that's the important one. Thank you. Uh, so on a physical level, I see pain getting released and the brain diarrhea. But on, a, um, on the next conscious level, I feel when I am in silence, things appear so clear. The decisions are made so clearly. And it's just so relaxing. It's just, it's like going to a spa or, I mean, that's the way I look at it. I'm in a spa. That's how I feel. Refreshing even. Yeah. Works for me. Thanks, Alka. Austin. Yeah, I think the first time I experienced silence, I bursted out into tears because I was like, wow, my mind stopped for the first time in my life. And uh, as I got somewhat better at it, I came to realize um, when I was in Peru and I was literally in like the middle of the jungle just by myself. And I remember I was like trying to sit upright and... I hear like this voice, like, just stop it. And so I just relaxed and I just got into this really calm meditative state. And I found a lot of ecstasy in that moment. And then even that voice came back as like, stop it. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And as soon as my mind got quiet again, I was like, oh my God, like no problem can exist if my mind is quiet for me, like all of my issues, you know, what am I going to do with my life? What am I doing in the jungle? <laughs> I I don't know how things are going to work out for me. And as soon as my mind got quiet, everything just like left. And um, I think that's so important for us to experience that. Um, and it's like the silence almost is... Um, it's, it's pretty much what you guys put in the, in the post, like silence is like the language of God. I think that's what, what the quote says. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, yeah. I don't know. I've, I've been practicing it for the last five years, and it's like the best thing that's ever happened to me. And what is your favorite way to do it? It's gotten to the point where I will be in a random place and my mind is just racing and then it just stops out of nowhere. Um, I think that's just because I've been practicing it for a while now. My favorite way of doing it is 
Um, whenever I get sunlight, whenever I feel the warmth of like the sun on my skin, my mind gets like my mind gets quiet. Whenever I see a tree, a very beautiful tree, my mind gets quiet. Um, but it'll happen when I'm in the grocery store and people are talking. I'm just like, oh, I'm quiet. <laughs> my mind stops. So, I don't know. I, I don't have a method, actually. It just tends to happen. It wouldn't surprise me if you do have a method, but you haven't <laughs> uh, modeled it, model it discreetly yet. Excuse me. Yeah, I agree. I think that's, that's a... A good possibility. Something to think about, Austin. I'll come back with a blueprint. <laughs> there you go. And James said in the chat, in moments of silence, a weight falls off my body and the world opens up. Capital W on the world. Would you like to say more about that, James? Um, three episodes come to mind in which um, internal dialogue had either stopped or it just went from being foreground my life, so totally background, I just don't notice it anymore. More. Um, first time it happened, uh, and I wasn't even trying for it, I was just doing an experiment, and I was, I was told you about it, I was in a park, and for 15 minutes, the world just glowed. There was no noise in my head. My body felt light and smooth. It was, wow. Um, second time, it was more of an internal thing. The noise stopped. And all weight, all drama, whatever, fell away. <coughs> and uh, it was almost like I was looking into my torso and there was a big not literally, but almost like a big glowing ball of light sitting down in here. Um, third time was more recently on retreat when we were walking around that area that we called yeah, the nest. And um, it wasn't as dramatic as the first two times, but once again, my body lightened up, even though I was, you know, a bit sleep deprived, a bit groggy, but uh, sorry. And um, everything became clear and beautiful and quiet and calm. So far, whenever it happens to me, outside of just short little episodes in meditation, it just, uh, for me, the body releases something and everything becomes lucid. That's the best way I can, I can put it at the moment. I'm sorry that I'm coughing my way through all this, um, but yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, James. Take it easy there. Yeah. Does anyone else want to share about their experiences with silence while we're in conversation? Sure, sure. And then Kyle, sorry about that. Yes. Ooh. On the train going north at, to Delhi, and Alka saw this, and maybe James, is that I didn't want to get sucked into the drama of finding our sleeping berths and things. And as soon as we found where we were going to be, and Alka said, you're up there, and I was straight up there. And I put my little bag down and I got still and I just lay flat. And everybody was commenting, has she gone to sleep? And there's like hundreds of people walking around, lights are on, whole families are eating curry at midnight, and I'm just thinking, no, 
I'm just going to be really still and not get sucked into the drama of what was happening around us. And I'm just going to take this opportunity just to be really still. So I don't have anything glamorous to share about silence or anything, but when I'm caught in chaos and that's that's just life and then you just think sit back and calm yourself and I want to share mostly about the breathing practice from last week talk. So when Mushtaq went inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. So I've been using that with my clients and in class when everybody was very rambunctious and we go, I'll say it's time to do a breath exercise and it just calms everybody down. So we then started doing it not only just one hand and then one hand we did it together. So we go, all right, so palm down. So we went inhale, exhale. And we actually try to bring our elbows together and our arms were straight from the body like this. A lot of people had a lot of difficulty coming in. So just them just focusing on that, all the other noises around them stopped and the room and the whole group found its silence together and then we moved on. So uh, thank you, Mushtaq, for that little exercise, but that's how I've actually started to, you know, refine it even more for myself. Like I, I can easily do that, but what am I feeling? And then sharing that with whoever I'm with, that was a, a very wonderful way of just bringing that full focus, feeling a movement first because they had to direct their fizzy minds onto something and that using that breath so they were noticing that they were curling over and that was a compressive force and then when they sat up and opened their chest it was inhale exhale and we started just making it even more exaggerated and then slower and smoother so that's what I wanted to share I still use all your things that you mentioned and think okay how can we actually make this um purposeful Nice. Thank you, Sherry. And nice shirt, too. Just mentioning that as an aside. <laughs> uh, Kyle, you ready to share? Yes. <laughs> um, I like the one word that you used, Mishtaq, about space, because for me, this is kind of like creating space and also like space for something new. Um, that's kind of where my mind leads for this because a lot of times I get sucked into my habits and daily routines and talking to people and get busy and my mind wanders away and uh, you know it's cool to I guess wake up or see something new and uh, that's been really cool and also on a different tangent the idea of like the interconnectedness of the body and the mind. Um, I noticed that if I can sit really still for a long time, that my mind also becomes calm. Um, I think there's something to that, but I need to flush it out some more. <laughs> a good observation and definitely good at reading your own body, you know, whether or not you extrapolate that to others if you find that that is true for you personally, you can build on that. You can use that as part of your toolkit. So that is not to be overlooked. And I loved how Cherie was talking about the fizzy mind, right? Sometimes we keep things fizzy by moving rapidly, talking rapidly, flitting from one thing to the next thing. And sometimes it does take us literally slowing down the words that we say, the rate of our breath, the flow of our movement, the jitteriness that can come with bouncing from task to task. And, you know, there are times that call for speed and perhaps bouncing from thing to thing. 
But we get to take charge of that. We get to engage with slowing down and speeding up and seeing how that impacts our etern internal state. And there's a lot to discover in that. So, to recap on this, ways to create silence for yourself. You have the external and the internal. The external is to withdraw your senses from everyday noise. In whatever way that takes. Yeah, go to the beach. Sometimes the beach is not silent, but depends on the beach you go to. Drive up into the mountains. Go to a park. Any place where the cacophony of life is a little bit uh, less extreme or close up your house, turn off your phone and just sit. Shut That's the hardest laptop. one. Yeah. Yeah. And you can create um, silence breaks at home, if nothing else, where for a half an hour, you're not looking at your computer screen. You're not looking at your phone. You are not listening to anything. You're just being quiet in yourself. But you're also not napping and falling asleep. Yes, so that's, that's the, the other part, part of this. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like James's thought may be relevant here in terms yeah. of parsing what we mean you know i just said we're not napping and this ties into that james says i don't know to what extent this is a cultural thing but when i try to explain this using the term quote silence unquote people assume it must be some kind of reduced state or impaired function an ex told me that she assumed it could only be a kind of numb stupidity until she glimpsed it for herself. Yeah, if you think about it, silence, uh, the definition might be slightly different, but uh, once you experience it, you know what it is. And that makes it tough. How do you elaborate on it with people who have not experienced that? I think it's more about doing rather than words at that point. I have been in scenarios where I'm sitting with a friend and we haven't seen each other in a while, but suddenly I have this intuition that what we both need is silence and he wants to ask me all kinds of questions and make jokes and catch up and I notice that I'm simply enjoying his presence and I had to tell him gently let's just be together right now let's just have a few minutes of us just sitting together and we don't need to talk right now. And I noticed that I was in a state of what we would call silence, awakeness, and he was getting fidgety. And I kind of had to just, by continuing to maintain my silence myself, I somehow allowed him to ride that wave with me and find it for himself as well once he got through all of his fidgeting and stuff. And that may mean tuning into each other's breathing. That may mean gazing at one another. 
that may mean holding hands and staring at the wall. I don't know. But just kind of taking the the fizziness out of the situation and giving us an opportunity to just literally be in silence together without it being full of the anticipation of what comes next. There's a time for that. In that moment, I felt it was not the time for that. So, the internal part of this is to find some way to still your thoughts. You know, I think about my fifth grade teacher and what it must have meant for him to never have his thoughts stop, to have a constant verbal monologue going on from uh, the moment he woke up to the moment he went to sleep and probably halfway through his sleep time too, to never stop talking to yourself. That's to me, that's a bit of a, a nightmare. Exhausting. So several ways to do it, as I mentioned. Find the space between the sounds. Find the space between the words. Extend that space. Stretch it. Or just focus on your breath. Let your chatter be there. Keep focused on your breath until your, your chatter goes away. Or stare at your chatter. Stare down. <laughs> That's right. If you keep staring at it, it will shut up because it, you'll realize that that noise is not you. There are hundreds of different ways to do this. Um, whole professions have been made out of teaching people how to do this. But go with the easy stuff. Ask yourself... What is it going to take for me to just shut up? <coughs> just let myself be quiet for a minute. If you can do it for a minute, you can do it for two minutes. If you can do it for two minutes, you can do it for 10. And you just let it stretch out. And you're going to discover Osama has something to say. Go for it, Osama. Oh, I didn't. I didn't mean to cut you off. What That's are we going right. to discover? Cut me off. I don't care. Okay. I ain't proud. <laughs> um. What I wanted. What I wanted to say is that even for me, what's what's helpful is dhikr has been really helpful in that in that arena. Meditation, um, even using a a mantra, a repetitive. Mantra, whatever it is, Allah, Allah. And even in that, that single pointedness, at some point, it drops off. It just, it, like, just drops. And then there's that moment of silence, um, which is interesting. Um, I had to pull this up uh, the other day. I I read this ayah and it just it hit me differently and it, it, I think it goes well with with what we're talking about. This is ayah number twenty, um, from chapter Taha. Twenty ayah number one o eight. There's a part in it that says وَخَشَعَتِ الْأَصْوَاتُ لِلرَّحْمَنِ. That means all voices will be stilled before the most merciful. And it kind of feels like that. Yeah, that's that's actually a good one for this. And using a dhikr like that, uh, that's one I didn't mention. So take the word Allah. And it just that just means God in Arabic. 
So don't don't get bent out of shape about what you think it might mean. It's it's you know in Arabic they say Allah, in German they say Gott, in um, Swedish they say God, in English they say God, in Spanish they say Dios, uh, and it's all the same thing, pointing at the same thing. So I like the Arabic because it sounds nice, and you say Allah. And then there's that pause. That pause is the silence. And then before you can find words, you say Allah again and find the silence. You can do that and you get to the point of you only say Allah to yourself once every five minutes. And then sit in the silence and listen to it. Mm -hmm. That's actually a very... Very fun method. Thanks, Sama. So, uh, Kyle, I did see you unmuted at some point. Was there something that you wanted to share? Uh, yeah, this is going back to what James had said about in silence, not becoming dull. And this is something that I kind of struggle with. I kind of have like meditation practice that I try to do daily. Um, but usually I just end up thinking and spacing away. out. Yeah. Floating away. <laughs> yeah. And my mind runs away with me again. So I just was trying to ask how, and I think we're we're kind of answering that. So mm. yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I know one common way people put it in meditation practice is, you know, really the practice is in the returning to the moment, watching yourself float away and then catching that and being like, oop, letting that go. Okay, starting fresh. And not really worrying about You know, how long have you been floating away for? That's beside the point. It's really about the the willingness to return to the practice, whether that's, you know, sitting in meditation or doing the exercise, whatever that might be, or listening to the silence. Because then you can have chatter about the chatter, and that's not a. That's not the exercise. That's that's yeah. First of all, this isn't an exercise. This is about just letting things be. James. I know that during some meditation sessions, I've had to actually keep my eyes open. Uh, particularly if I'm doing it in the morning so I don't drift off into vagueness while still having a some kind of point of focus. Um, and a tip that I was taught a while back, though, you have to be fairly stable in meditation to do it if you're starting to drift off, is to just sort of gently lift your head up a few times if you can do it without lots of triggering internal dialogue. That can kind of wake you up a bit. So there's two physical tactics that can suit a particular individual sort of meditating with the eyes oh not staring open but sort of like or well, half closed and if you're going to do open eye it's better to fix it on a point usually so it's what you're taught and um just this sort of gentle sort of uh, 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 um of the head just to sort of stop yourself getting too dreamy and tired i know that's of any use to you kyle I've, I've had some success with that in the past Kyle expresses his gratitude. So, I mean, you can do this exercise. Oops, exercise. You can find the silence even when you're not sitting still. But it may be easier to start there. 
what are your thoughts on that, Mr. Doc? No particular thoughts. Yeah. So, again, you can practice for yourself. You can figure out huh, what is the mode through which I most easily discover silence. Is it while exercising? Is it while sitting? Is it while witnessing the beauty of nature, perhaps? Experiencing the sun on your skin? Is it while doing dishes? No, definitely not well. <laughs> for me, it has been. Maybe not for you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the thing is, and I alluded to this earlier, but I'm going to say it plainly now. Uh, without being able to cultivate silence, none of your other practices are going to work. They just aren't. You can't do self-observation when you're blathering to yourself and you're inside your head. You can't do self-remembering. You can't do any form of meditation without being able to cultivate a little silence. Yes. Take care of it, Alka. Yeah. Sorry. It's That's okay. okay. We're just about to wrap up anyway. This is a short one tonight. Thank you. Bye. So, you know, we've talked about breath being foundational. Silence is also foundational. And you will not be able to do the work of discovering your patterns and unpacking them and perhaps reshaping them if you're busy with your other chatter that goes on in your mind all day. Perhaps it can be a process of learning how to put it in the background. But as long as it's in the foreground, you're just, you're on a hamster wheel and you're going to end up dealing with the consequences of that. Ian? Yeah, I can... I've been wondering how to, uh, whether I I can be coherent enough to express some of my views on this. Yeah, please. But that, what you just said about putting it in the background is basically the same as what my long-term teacher once said that I specifically remember about... Uh, what happens during the practice that we do and and so i've been i mean that happens to me all the time i practice an hour a day and uh my experience is definitely the 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 the, the chatter i become detached from it it's not, it doesn't seem to me like a silence in the way that you've been talking about it, um, of actually stopping thought, but being detached from it. And in fact, recently I've been, at, I've been really paying attention to where the chatter comes from. And I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> That's why I've been watching it. Uh, and, and of course, in order to watch it, there's got to be something else that is watching it. And is pay and is, and I, this is particularly what I don't know how to express. Um, is, let's say, is forming opinions about it. And uh, so I found this talk interesting because this idea of paying attention to the silence between words and, and trying to focus on that is something that I'll very likely try using. Um, I think on, 
s switching around to a couple of couple of other things. I think I'm particularly lucky because I live out here in suburbia in an area that's really pretty quiet and I've got quite well insulated windows <laughs> so my house is really uh, quite quiet and one of the funny things I've always thought is that many years ago I heard somebody who was just a who was talking about that a lot of people don't like their houses to be too quiet that they want some kinds of sounds going whether it's the hvac or, or whatever but for me personally i really like the house to be quiet and uh i'm, I'm just lucky that uh the house is really quiet uh there's one other thing that I think may be relevant to this. I had a I've talked about uh my uh personal vision qu vision quest that I went through in 1987. And during that time I was really focused on intellectual things and I think when I talked about it before I forgot to mention that in effect one of the main things I was doing was uh, essentially making my own co-ops in the, in the Zen sense. And it got very intense. And towards the end of that period, one of the quite remarkable things that happened was that my brain was just going like crazy and the voice and the, and the chatter was getting really intense and it was like a hand reaching inside my brain and turning down a volume knob and i took that as a sign that i shouldn't be doing that anymore hmm. um why was that hmm? why was that you took oh, it as a sign that you shouldn't do it anymore? Yeah. Uh, because it, it was very clear that whatever it was that decided to reach in and turn down the volume of, was getting bothered by all the chatter that was being Oh, generated. yeah. Now I understand. Um, so I think that's really all I had to, all I can say about about any of this. Thanks for sharing, Ian. Yeah, I think we're all coming to this conversation with varying experiences and varying degrees of the experience of silence. And I mentioned, you know, backgrounding the mental chatter. On a certain level, I think that that is... a step towards what we're talking about. I think really the idea is to, as Mushtaq was saying, listen for the silence. First, we have to learn how to be less attached to the chatter that takes place. And then perhaps it becomes easier to explore letting it go and perhaps on some level it's still there but if we're not hearing it does it matter like the sound of a tree falling in a forest <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, I mean, in the fact that if it's not impacting us, if it's not taking control, if we have developed the wherewithal to experience the release that comes with silence,
Hey, Noor. Um, your story about your fidgety friend. Yeah. Did you notice a release in him after he sat in that silence? Like, is that exactly what he needed at that time? I don't know if it was exactly what he needed. I do think that it took discipline on his part to be able to sit there with me and just kind of in a way let me have my moment right but at the same time it was kind of like he had to wrestle with his expectations and then let them go and from conversations we had following and in the years since even because we're still very good friends he was not quite able to experience the quote-unquote silence that I was experiencing, but it was a stretch for him that he felt was worthwhile. It was kind of just like a reminder how you know we can get so accustomed to chatter and um, noise and static that the silence that should be beautiful can be extremely awkward. <laughs> yeah, and I I don't know if it was so much awkward for him. I think it started out that way. Hmm. But given that I was able to hold the space and not make it weird or like, you know, I had nowhere else I needed to be. I was there with him hmm. in every sense. And so it was as if, he got the memo that we weren't in a rush to go anywhere that there was nothing else that needed to be done and that this was in a sense me trusting him with my own experience as well you know my own pursuit of that silence in that moment he was helping me create that for myself as well Interesting. Um, yeah, I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't and can't force him to have any particular kind of experience. Mm -hmm. But I could encourage him to give it an opportunity to arise. Yeah. And it's a very um, simple way to, uh, I feel, help people wake up. Because a lot of times when they come in, they're expecting a conversation. But to say that we're not talking and we're just going to sit here, like snaps them out of the trance. We don't need to even say anything. You know, and yeah. it can be, it's a very, um, I don't know what you would even call it, technique or I something. Say, yeah. You know, I mean, to just say, no, we're not going to talk. We're going to sit here for five, maybe even 10 minutes and not say anything and then see how you feel. You know, 10 minutes that's available to you at any time. <laughs> Yeah, we kind of did that at the no, retreat. It's, and it's free, just two nothing. years ago. Yes, yeah, it's, I would it's really start. Powerful. It's tough. People are like, I don't know what to do with myself right now, and they squirm and they get distracted, and that's their prerogative. But if they can get used to the idea that this is what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. then and it doesn't have to be awkward, and it. And I do think it becomes less awkward the more you do it. Yeah. It depends on the person, too. Well, you know, their own quirks and what they're bringing into the scenario. But mm. it's worth a try. Yeah. It's absolutely worth a try. That's it. All right. Well, that's pretty much all I've got to say on the subject. So let's 
pop over into Brady Bunch mode. One thought. Yeah. This friend and I also, we have rapport. So build rapport, you know. So people weren't like, what the fuck is this random guy making me sit here for five minutes of my paid time? But a little bit of rapport creates the motive to to be with you in that moment and relax into the situation. So that's all I got to say about that. Brady Bunch mode. Well, everyone, thanks back for... In Brady Bunch mode as Yeah. we speak. Huh. Thanks for joining us for this chat. There is the possibility that you may have experienced a little bit of silence for yourself during this conversation, considering it has been a pretty low-key chat this evening. And uh, you can look for the silence yourself this week between the words. Yeah, and next week, we're going to have a surprise for you. So be sure to tune in and see what the heck we're talking about. Yeah. Looking forward to it. All right. So we can wave to each other and everybody watching on the replay on YouTube. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.